All right. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to today's Web Design and Development webinar. Today is June 8th. We're excited to have um, Kevin Hannigan here today. He's our instructor, instructor for the program. Um, I am the Interim Director for Professional and Continuing Ed. We refer to ourselves as PACE here at Oregon State. Um, today's session, as I um, shared with all of you, is going to be recorded and available with, uh, to all of you within the next 24 hours. Expect an email from us, from PACE, with the recording link, and feel free to share that. Feel free to respond back um, with questions, further questions. We want to make sure that you're feeling comfortable with all of the um, enrollment process and all of the expectations of you as a student in the, in the course and in the program going forward. So a little bit about Oregon State University. We are the land grant or, um, institution here in Oregon. And um, our group, Professional and Continuing Ed, develops continuing education. We're the arm of the university for outreach and engagement into the community, developing short courses, certificate programs, workshops, and focused in employee training, doing corporate training in companies. Um, so we really are focusing on the non-credit certificate programs for the campus. And our agenda for today is to give you some background on Kevin and myself on the roles, going over the roles for web design and development so you can resonate with the program um, as, a, as an enrollee of the program, understand all of the courses that are offered in the program at PACE and um, what benefits of the, of the courses um, that you would benefit from and the outcomes. Um, there will be time for question and answer. Kevin and I are more than welcome and willing to participate in a rich discussion, so we welcome those questions early and often. And I want to make sure you feel comfortable leaving with our contact information so that we can follow up with your questions directly. All right. Did I leave anything out of the agenda, Kevin, you wanted to add? Sounds perfect. Right. Here. Oops. So here's Kevin. So he is the Vice President of Knowledge Learning at Quark, and he has over 10 years experience in web design and development. He's been teaching um, in this field at other institutions for about six years. Um, and so we're very, he's author of four books, and we're very proud to have him as our resident expert and instructor for this entire program. Um, I'm looking forward to the synergy that he'll bring and the consistency he'll bring course after course and really becoming a coach and a mentor to all of the students that he, um, that he will come in contact with through our program. So we're excited to have you on board, Kevin. Thanks so much for being here. Do you want to talk a little bit more about your background? Yeah, sure. And, and I, I didn't want to come off as too old. So I said 10 years of experience. But I've really been working with web pages since uh, mid-'90s when they started out and started originally doing a lot of website design, development, graphics. Um, and then just recently started working with companies around building old web application solutions, uh, go-to-market strategies, a lot around search engine optimization and internet marketing. So I can talk a little bit about how it started in the beginning, where it is now, and where the trends are going in the future. Um, built probably thousands of websites at this point. So a lot of what you'll see in the courses are very practical examples and practical use cases, not so much theory or quizzes, and, and we'll talk about that obviously in a lot more detail as well. Thanks, Kevin. All right, so a little bit about the program. So the program is 100% online. We like to refer to it as um, instructor-led, so prompted, instructor-led, mentored week by week, but there's 100% online. Um, we refer to that as asynchronous, so there is assignments. Um, you know, that are weekly prompted of you, but there's not actually a designated time to sign up and be present in the course. Um, Kevin may sprinkle through some synchronous components where you'll be live with him almost like an office hour, um, but that's really the, the main format of the course. 100% online, six total courses in the program, and here's kind of the format. And I'll let Kevin kind of go through each course just briefly on, the, on what um, the overview is. Yeah, thanks, Molly. So, and, and we'll talk about you know where these courses came from, but we're we're filling the gambit of the entire web design development spectrum. And um, although you might think of it as just hey, building a website, there's actually three or four critical components that go into that. And so the first course, information design for the web, really treats the web, uh, the website from from the ground up, the architecture. How do you build the content? How do you build the color theory? How do you build 
uh, how many pages go under each subpage and what's called the information architecture. So you're you're building your site to be architecturally sound. And then the next course, introduction to HTML and CSS coding. That's the intro course where you're actually going to build your first website. Those are the two, quote unquote, languages or markup languages they would use to to code up your site. Um, if you were going to do it from scratch, or even if you were going to use a, a web host like Weebly or WordPress that will kind of give you templates of websites, you still have to know these technologies to kind of tweak them. So we start there as the basics. As you want to add in more interactivity into your websites, um, form validation, events, calendars, uh, image thumbnails that rotate, you need uh, something called JavaScript. And so in the JavaScript programming course, um, it, it says programming, but don't be intimidated. It's not hardcore computer science programming. It's a little more lightweight, but it is still programming, uh, teaching you how to code those elements into your website. Or a key learning objective in that course is not to code it from scratch, but don't reinvent the wheel. If there's sites out there, like there are, that have thousands of samples, uh, we teach you how to take them, but tweak them and customize them so they're your own. Obviously, sites that allow you to take them under free use, license use. Um, but that's a key learning objective in that course. A lot of sites have very rich graphics and, and a need for rich graphics. So it, it's kind of a uh, kind of been evolution where sites now more and more will use Photoshop to, to build out their, whether it's their logos or just their entire graphical um, interface. So that's what's taught in the web graphics with Photoshop course. And as we go more into the back end, a lot of sites now are not just static marketing sites. They're, they're interactive. They're actually web applications. There's e-commerce, there's bi-directional communication. And to do that, you need to do some other type of uh, programming that sits on a web server. And there's many languages out there that do that. Uh, the ones that we focus on are open source and freely available. And they typically have the largest market share. So you can start with these. And, and the language is PHP. And then we also teach you how to work with databases. So the database that we use is MySQL. And again, I don't want to intimidate anyone. We're teaching this assuming you're coming into this program without knowledge of databases and without knowledge of programming. Uh, it's not an expert course where we you have to know how to normalize a database. You have to know SQL going into it. it. It starts at base one. And then the final course, graphic design for the web. Think of that as like the interior decorator for the website. The structure is up. Now you're going to make it look pretty. Um, and you're going to add in the colors and the fabrics and whatever. And that's what you're doing for the website you're making it graphically pleasing after you've built the architecture. And that wraps up all the six courses. It kind of gives you a good spectrum of everything you need to know about building um, a website. That's great. Well, let's take a deeper dive here. So um, I know that was a brief overview, and this was probably a better introductory slide to show that. But um, let's take a deeper dive into the program. And I want to ensure that everybody is getting their questions you know, coming to mind and answered. So use your chat feature or the questions tab Start sending them in, and then we'll work them in throughout the, co the conversation. So Kevin, talk a little bit about what's going on here with design, graphics, development, and marketing, and how web website and development yeah. play a part. It, it goes back to you know what I said earlier. Um, website, it's, it's a very large industry. It, it's not a very specific. You're not um, a brick master where you lay bricks or an electrician, um, even though I guess electricians have different specialists. There's, there's different specialties within web design development because there's a lot that goes into a website. And I like to break them down into four components. There's the design, and we'll talk about this in a, in a few minutes, but this is the information architecture. This is the color theory. This is the project management. This is the aesthetically, visually pleasing look of a website. This is using proper user interface design patterns, building for accessibility, building for mobility, building for responsive webs. All that kind of goes into a design element where you're not necessarily creating the site, but you're you're architecting and designing the site. And then the next uh, component of web design is, is the actual graphics. A lot of your site will be graphically please uh, include graphics and logos. So covering things like Photoshop or other third-party plugins like Flash that will add a high degree of graphics to your site um, is something that there are specialists out there for as well. Uh, then obviously programming the site, you have to actually build it. So that's the development arm. And as I kind of alluded to in the previous slide, that also has subsections. There's building the core website. There's adding in what's called client-side programming. There's adding in server-side programming. 
I'll get into some analogies of what all of those mean in a couple slides. Um, and then there's the point of if you build it, will they come? Not necessarily, unless you make sure you build it for search engine optimization and make sure that you know how to market it properly on the internet. Uh, even though it's available for everyone in the world to access, it doesn't mean that people are gonna find it. So what are the strategies to really promote your site and promote your brand for your site? And I kind of think these are the four tenets of anyone that wants to learn everything about graphic design, uh, web design, and also development. We start giving you kind of a high level overview of all of these, but you might not want to be a specialist in one of these. You might want to be a specialist just in design. It's still good for you to know basics of HTML, and it's still good for you to know marketing. You might want to be a deep dive internet marketing person. You still should know how to build a basic website. Those skills kind of come in handy. So the way the program is structured is it gives you overarching approaches to all of these, and then you can go into deeper dives later on on some of these specialties um, if you decide that's the path you want to take. Or if you're going to be a one-man show or a one-woman show and be a contractor, um, you do have to be a specialist in all of this. So this kind of gives you that diverse range of, of what you're looking at. Great. All right, so who should be in the program? What, what are some of the personas that you see um, normally in your courses? Yeah, this is where it gets really interesting is, you know, over the decades of teaching this, you see such a wide range of people um, all coming to web design development for a different reason. So I'm just going to at a high level review some of those. We have a lot of people that are career switchers. That could be someone that used to work at a newspaper and now their newspaper went digital. So now they're a digital editor and they need to learn how to chunk content on a web page because, you know, a, a 5,000 word essay on a newspaper is not going to be a 5,000 word essay on the internet. It's going to look a little bit different. Um, we have freelancers that have day jobs. They're happy with their day jobs, but they're like, you know what, it'd be really nice if I could build a few websites on the side or do a couple graphics on the side or, or do some side hobby projects. Um, so it, it's someone who's not doing it full-time, but just doing it to, to freelance. We have a lot of people that come to us um, from marketing communication backgrounds. They are in charge of their company's website. They're not building it. They're not designing it. But one of the values of a program like this is it gives them enough information to talk intellectually in those meetings and make sure they're not taking, get take, taken advantage of. So you don't have the, uh, the project manager from the third party company doing your website saying, you know what, oh, we need to add a calendar in here that's gonna be 10 years. It, it kind of avoids that scope creep, but it also gives you enough information to manage the project from your side without actually having to get into the weeds and do the actual development. Uh, We've had people who are artists that used to do um, paper uh, and have brick and mortar stores and they wanted to do more computer art, digital art. So they have come and taken the Photoshop courses to learn how to do their trade. Maybe they just bought a new Surface tablet that has the pen where they could make it look very similar to a print design, but there's different tenants on a digital design because resolutions are different, pixels are different. So they have to kind of use what they already know, but then learn some of the new concepts that are unique to a digital medium. Of a bunch of people that are programmers. Um, I myself, my background, I was a computer science programmer in college. And when I went to college decades ago, we didn't have web programming. The language I learned on has been outdated for almost two decades. So you have a lot of people now that are using programming languages, but they want to kind of up level their skills and learn the newer languages. And it's going to be a little bit easier for them because they've already got the core concepts of programs and the languages nowadays are built in such a way it's actually easier and more intuitive to use than it was back in the 90s. Um, but you get some people doing that to kind of up-level those skills. A lot of people that come to us that are analysts and they're trying to analyze the tech industry and they might just want to write a blog post about a technology or they want to learn about, you know, they hear through all of these buzzwords. What is software as a service? What is cloud? What is a mashup? What is a rich internet technology? What is a responsive web page? What is web 2.0? What is HTML5? And they just get overloaded with terminology and they can't articulate it, but they want to articulate it. They want to understand those concepts and see how companies are using them and write about them in their articles or their analysis. So they learn about the latest trends in the industry by coming here. All of our content's updated more or less every semester. So you do learn the latest versions and the latest buzzwords and you know what they mean. 
you might not learn how to code them. You're not going to leave here and become a, a rich internet application developer in, in a semester, but you'll know what the concept is. And then finally, we have the hobbyists. We have, I, I can't count how many people I've had take a Photoshop class that are like, you know what, I, I'm retired or I have time and I used to do something else and I just want to learn how to do photo collages with my family or I just want to learn how to edit photos. And even though there's so many online tools that do it for you now for free, there's still always that gap of things you want to do yourself uh, because you can do it better and you have more control. And so we have a lot of those hobbyists that come and visit us just, just for those reasons. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I don't see any questions at this time, but keep them coming. Keep brainstorming some things you may have. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the approach, um, web design development yep. and the series of the program. And, and so this, this, um, this next section, I, I kind of go through the slides a little bit quicker, but we will give you the slides out as a reference. You can have them as background. When people come, one of the first questions they, they ask me is, you know, I, I don't understand the web design taxonomy. I, I don't understand graphic design, web design, web development, what it is, who does what. And, and I kind of say, okay, to me, it's actually very similar to building a house. And, and you might not be building a house, but you can relate to these analogies. So through the next set of slides, I'm going to kind of walk through and, and give the analogy. I'm going to start with building a house, and I'm going to map it to building a website, and then show you what roles those are in the in the web design industry. So if we can go to the, uh, the next slide. Typically, when you start building a house, you hire a general contractor. That is someone who's responsible for the entire project. They're not going to do all of the work, uh, but they know who to call, they know who to hire, they know who to bring in, who the specialists are, the plumbers, the, the, the carpentry, the HVAC, the electrician, all of that stuff. Um, and typically, this is the one that's communicating with the customer. They, you wouldn't, as a customer, might not talk to the electrician. You might not talk to the plumber. You would talk to the general contractor, and that is their main job in the entire thing is to organize everything. If we go to the next level down on the next slide, we have someone who would be typically called an architect. So if you're going to build an addition on your home, or you're actually going to build a new home, the first thing you have to do is you have to hire an engineer. Um, or an architect, and they're going to build out a blueprint. Um, they might do it if your kitchen's being modeled. They specifically do it when any structural elements are involved, but they might also do it um, to help define what kind of uh, supplies you need. So they're going to come out, and they're going to use a tool or by hand, and they're going to architect basically the site using me as the homeowner's um, functional and technical requirements. So to me, a technical or a functional requirement would be all right, I have four kids. Do I want three bedrooms? Do I want four bedrooms? Do I want five bedrooms? Um, do I need a bathroom on the first floor? If there's a second floor, I need stairs to the second floor. How many windows do I need? How many outlets do I need per code? Um, if there's a bathroom, I need to have a vent. Where's the vent going? If there's a kitchen, what stove are you going to have? Is there going to be a vent that goes to the outside? So the architect listens to what the customer needs and they architect a wireframe or a blueprint that says this is everything that our room, our house needs to have. It doesn't show the colors. It doesn't show the bells and the whistles. It shows the functional architecture of what that should look like. They then hand this off on the next slide to builders. The builder is going to take the blueprint. They're going to go to the hardware store, and they're going to buy all the lumber. They're going to come back, and they're going to frame the house up. They're not going to do any of the design work. You probably will not see a builder going in and putting curtains on your window. You probably won't see them uh, potentially even painting your house. Uh, maybe they might do some tile work, but they're not really doing any finish work. They're doing the heavy lifting, the framing, the structural elements that were defined by the, the architect. Once you have that done, then you hand it over to the interior designer, which is on the next slide, and that's the person that comes in and a lot of times you might skimp on this on a project. You might do it yourself. But this is the person that takes what you've built and actually understands your kind of mood for the site. What kind of like feng shui do you want? Do you want contemporary? Do you want colonial? Um, do you want dark colors? Do you want light colors? They don't change anything structurally, although sometimes you watch TV shows, you see a designer knock a wall down. In general, what they're doing is they're adding color. They're adding mood. 
they're arranging patterns. They're arranging your site. Um, you've already defined you have a bathroom, but now you might define the color palette for it. You've already designed a bedroom. You want to design the color palette for it. And, and that's really what the interior designer is meant to do. Um, and then finally, you have to fill the room. So you go and you have someone that does the finish work, and they're going to add the cabinets. They're going to put the carpet. They're going to put the bed in. They're going to put the couch in. Um, at, at the end of the day, you kind of have the work done. Uh, there is one final step where there are some people that like to, to kind of go above and beyond, and, and they want something even more visually pleasing. So maybe in their kid's room, they want to have a mural of, of a Disney character. Or maybe in the basement, they, they have a wine cellar, and they want to do steps that look like an Italian you know, steps into a house. So you'd bring an artist in to do things like custom artwork, custom signs. Maybe you have a bar, and you want a custom sign built in the basement um, or whatnot. Those are all the rules that are involved in building a house. Now what I'm going to do is go back through the slides again, but now we're equated to building a website, so you can kind of see the, the parallels. So we just have the next set of slides are, are very similar, but I'm adding the bottom component. So instead of a general contractor, a website has a project manager. They're the ones always talking to the customer. They're the ones understanding from the customer what the goals of the website site are. They're the ones who outsource who's going to be doing the work, who's going to be doing the graphics, who's going to be doing the design. They're the ones that do the project plan. They're the ones that get paid the bill, and then they pay the specialist. Um, they're not necessarily doing all of the work. Sometimes they might get their hands dirty and do a little about it, but they're the ones that are communicating with the customer. And a lot of times this might be someone who's in the marketing communications department. They own the website for the company, but they're not doing everything, but they have ultimate responsibility over it so they need to have some level of aptitude about all of these various components that make up the website. So then you had the architect who was building the framing and the engineering uh, of the site. On a website, we call that an information architect. And I know it says information, not structural architect. But really what they're doing is they're listening to the customer's requirements and goals for the site. So if the customer says, I want you to build me a store so I can sell my brand of sneakers. In the information architect's head, they're saying, okay, sneakers, sale, e-commerce. I need an e-commerce component for my site. Um, I need a place where students can post questions um, to collaborate or, or post feedback on other um, sneakers, kind of like you see on Amazon. So they're listening to the customer. They're listening to what happens and what the customer needs, and they're going to design a blueprint. And that blueprint actually looks just like a wireframe for a house, but it's a wireframe for, for a website. And it's a wireframe for the entire organization of the website. So from the home page, it almost looks like an org chart. How many subpages do you have? Is there too many? Is there too small? How do you organize them? You organize them based off what the goals of the site are. So if someone, if a goal of a site is to accept donations, you better architect the site so that a accepting donations link is front and center on pretty much every page. That's kind of there. And, and going back to what happens if you don't do that, that would be the equivalent of building a house that has four bedrooms but no kitchen, or building a bathroom that has a toilet but don't have any showers anywhere. You kind of have to own that entire process and build out this wireframe from a structural point of view. Then you hand it over to the builder who's going to build the site, or in the website, you're going to hand it over to what we call the developers. And this is where it kind of differs a little bit. The builder is going to use HTML and build out the frame of the site. They're going to take the wireframe and they're going to convert it to a very skeleton looking web page that has structurally built HTML. Uh, and then they're going to go and they're going to add any more components into it. So think of the server side developer maybe as like a like a smart house. If if you have to build in a house that has you know you an application, we can change the lighting, you can change the thermometer. The server side developer is going to do all those back end scripts like connecting to a database, doing e commerce work, um, storing log files or, or feedback from students inside of there. So they're going to be actually building the entire site, and, and that, that's why we call them the developers. They're not just doing a blueprint, they're actually designing it and uploading it to the website for us. 
Then you have the people that come in, the interior decorators. And in the web design world, we call them web designers. They're the ones that are going to work on understanding the goals and the mood of the site using things like a color theory, using things like user experience design patterns. They're going to make your website graphically pleasing. They're going to make sure that the colors match. They're going to make sure that the colors or the mood represents the goals of your site. Um, you know, green means money, for example. You've all heard that one. So depending on, you know, what brand you're in and what your goals are, they'll pick a color theme with you. They'll pick a mood board with you. They'll figure out how background colors to use, what fonts to use, and they'll make your site visually pleasing, just like an interior decorator would to the house. Um, and then, almost last but not least, at the end of the day, you've built a web page. You've, mark it, you've marked it out. You've used the HTML to build the structure of the website. You've defined the color that you want to use in there. And now you need to move in the furniture. So you need to move in the content. The, the website is, is empty right now. You need to add in the text, the images, the articles, the blogs, whatever they are. Um, and that's someone that's called a content editor. And that's when I go back to the people, the career changers. We see a lot of people that were editors in a newspaper. And now they're editors in, on a website. Their job is to take content that wasn't designed for the web or that was designed for the web and make it designed for the web. So they learn about information chunking, um, content chunking. They learn about the inverted pyramid. They learn about if you only have certain real estate on a web page, what's important to cover. Um, and they will start adding in that text and those non-structural elements like images as well into your site. And then finally, you might have the people that want the, the murals on the page or the bar, um, custom bar or sign or, or similar. You have an artist where you might say, okay, my site's kind of plain. I want this really nice logo. You go to the graphic designer and they're going to build a custom graphic for you um, in something like Photoshop or similar. And then you're, as the content editor, going to plug it into your site. And, and that's kind of the entire spectrum of the front end of building the site. What we didn't cover in this role, obviously, is the internet marketing and the search engine optimization. Those kind of fall under multiple categories, like the project manager and also the web designer. Uh, and so they're talked about in the majority of our courses at some level or another, depending on what role you are. Um, so then you might say, all right, well, I understand the roles. How do those map back to those six courses? Um, that we highlighted in the program. And you can see here, if you want to be a project manager, so you want to know everything about the web and how to build a website from beginning to end and who needs to be involved and how to ask the customer questions to define the goals of the site, how to identify technical requirements, you would take our information design for the web course. Similar, if you're that information architect, you would take our information design for the web course. One of, the, uh, one of the exercises we do in there is the first week, we give you a set of, of cards that are all pages on a school's website, and you're supposed to organize them um, in logical groups, logical information architecture. And it's amazing to see everyone does things differently, but what we're missing is we're not telling you the goals of the site. And then we go through the rest of the course, and we go through the goals of the site and the functional and technical requirements and, and all of that. And then the second to last semester, uh, week of the semester, we give you the same assignment, but you have the knowledge of the goals of the site. And 90% of the, of the layout is identical for every student, whereas in the beginning, no one's is ever the same. And that just shows the importance of identifying the goals of the site and using the scientific methodology of architecting pages. So that kind of becomes a fun experiment um, for everyone. Then you have the builders, so the client-side developer, the server-side developer. Um, if you're going to be just building the front end, so kind of just like the framing of a web page, you're going to do the introduction to HTML and CSS, cascading style sheets. If you're going to do, um, and also JavaScript programming as well, if you're going to do any of the back end stuff, uh, you want to connect to a database, you want to build a guest book, you want to store feedback from potential visitors to your site, you're going to take the PHP in the MySQL course um, to learn that. If you're a web designer, like an interior decorator, you're going to take our graphic design web for the course. It pairs nicely with the information design for the web, whereas one talks about building the structure, the other one talks about applying the style on top of the structure. 
uh, if you're just a content editor, you're just someone's already built the page for you, someone's already designed the page, and you're just adding in the HTML, which is, is a very important job. You're going to take the introduction to HTML course and, and learn how to do that. And then finally, if you're a graphic designer and you want to build custom, really cool digital online graphic and artwork to add into your site or anywhere else, you would take the web graphics with Photoshop, of course. And that kind of gives you a nice overview of, of if you want to come in as a specialist or if you want to take the whole program, you get the real range and the scope of all of those things, which are really valuable to have, even if you end up specializing in just one of them. So if you decide you want to be a JavaScript programmer, you still should know a little bit about server-side programming to know what's possible. It will help you in your job. Um, and you should also know how a website is designed because it, there are going to be times where you might have to do a little more than just what you're being asked to as a client-side developer. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> just going to check to see if anyone had any questions in the chat panel. We have one question so far. Um, so I, I kind of kind of moving into our question. The one question that we have here is um, Chloe's asked. She wants to take the course, but it's maybe potentially during her slow season. Is the course going to be offered again? So yeah, in just a couple of slides, we're going to talk about the offering schedule and how frequently the courses will be offered and kind of the entry point to taking courses. And I I think that goes back to we want to make sure. Um, you know, these course, course meet you where you are. So this is a perfect example of what is the, you know, the most efficient use of your time and your money and your, and your, your effort for what, what you need. And so we, we can kind of custom a path. I think the entry point is, is where you are and what you need. Um, and then kind of then building on those skills. Um, we are open enrollment, so there is, we do offer our courses on a certain quarterly fashion, but um, at the same time it's open enrollment, so there is not prerequisites to, to, the, to entry. Um, we, don't, we don't look at transcripts or your prior knowledge prior to getting in, so we're really a theory-based um, approach to learning, but very practical as Kevin, you know, even demonstrating today the practical nature of the, of the training and the project-based learning environment that you'll be really hands-on and, you know, really doing a project that's based on something that, that you are going to be using in your, in your work. So um, that kind of gets into kind of what does the course consist of. Um, so Kevin's going to talk a little bit about the topics, um, the weekly basis, the nature of the, of the course, and, and the flow. Yep. So I, I know a lot of you might be uh, new to distance learning or online learning, and, and I kind of want to alleviate some of the concerns of, of um, this approach. And, and it is a very flexible environment. Uh, so I'll kind of overview what happens each week, and then I'll kind of go into some details. So every week, you'll log into the site, and in beginning of the week, we will launch a new section for that week. And that section will have a variety of assets in there. It will have a PDF that's reading notes that a lot of times the reading notes will be things that we create. Sometimes we'll reference external articles for use cases. Um, sometimes we'll reference uh, online blogs or similar. But typically it's a PDF we can download and you can read throughout the week. Then there's always a uh, asynchronous video lecture. So as Melanie said, asynchronous means you can watch it whenever. You can watch it Monday. You can watch it Friday. You can watch it 8 AM. You can watch it 8 PM. Um, and I'm a big believer of micro lectures. My attention span isn't what it used to be. So I try to keep everything 15 minutes or less. And if I just need more time, I just make two videos and you can watch them separately. So typically the way we break it out is the first lecture is, is more high level. It's like a traditional lecture you would get in the university. It's talking about the concept similar to what you'll read in the notes. It's not giving you anything new. It's just a different way to learn. So we've had some students say, you know, I prefer the notes because I can download them, I can write on them and mark them up. I've had some people say, yep, but I enjoy the audio aspect of the video lecture. Um, I've had some people say they like both, but they both complement each other. It's not that there's something in one that's not in the other. And then the second lecture is typically the practical hands-on. Okay, now you've seen it, now let's do something. Let's build a website. Let's add in a JavaScript calendar. Let's validate a form. Let's connect to a database. Let's build a mood board. Let's build a project plan. Um, and that typically lecture that's demo-based is going to be your homework assignment. So you'll see me do it, 
and then you will have an assignment to complete for that week that's due at the end of the week. And it's never a quiz. It's always that practical thing. Build your first web page. Add in a table to your web page. Um, perform the style element. Find this user pattern from the web. Uh, customize it. Uh, that follows free licensing, of course. Customize it. Make it your own. Uh, and those are always going to be passed in at the end of the week. There's always discussion forums that are open. Um, in the programming courses, they tend to be used less because people are very specific with their questions. Uh, this is a bug. What's not working? Uh, in the design question uh, courses, people tend to be a little more open in, in giving their give and take on their thoughts of things. So the discussion forums are used in all of the courses, but they're used in different levels depending on whether it's a design course or a programming course. And where the real value add to you is, is unlike a university where you have an instructor that's lecturing and then grading you, the difference here is you also have a mentor. You have a subject matter expert that is available to answer your questions. And, and we don't want you to submit something if you don't understand it. So there are, will be, uh, as uh, Melanie referred to, kind of sometimes formal office hours where it might just be a Google Hangout or a Skype that people can come at at 7 p.m. and ask questions. But you can ask questions pretty much any day through Skype, Google Chat, or phone. So when you're doing your homework, if there's a bug in it and it doesn't work, the last thing I want you to do is just submit it and, and not complete it, because then you haven't learned it. So you try to do it. I recommend do it. If it doesn't work, take a break. Don't look at it the rest of the day. Go back the next day. A lot of times you'll resolve the issue. If you don't resolve the issue within 45 minutes, don't look at it again. Email me, tell me what the problem is, and we'll walk through it. And that way it kind of aids you learning the concept as opposed to fearing, oh, if I don't submit it by Saturday at 10, I'm going to get a C or whatever. Um, so that's the structure of the course. It's meant to, you're all here because you want to learn, and we're here because we want to support you in learning. So it's a very supportive environment where we're not necessarily giving you quizzes to test the outcome of how well did you learn it, we're more worried about are you learning it than assessing whether you learned it. So it's the act of building the practical examples that we focus on. It's not the act of, all right, you have a final, which is a 30-page multiple choice exam, so we can qualify, you know what you're doing. If you're doing the exercises and you're working with us to answer the questions and you get them, you're going to know what you're doing. So just to alleviate any of those concerns, that's what the online course is like I know people travel, I know people get sick, I know people have families, I know people have just those bad weeks. So we don't want to be hardcore and say if you miss the deadline, you're going to lose half of your credit. What we want to do is be flexible and say, okay, if you have those weeks, let us know and we'll accommodate. Uh, and the course is built in a way that you do have time to make up things. We don't want someone that's not involved in the course. And what I mean by that is someone that logs in on day one and then doesn't log in again for day 39 and tries to do their homeworks, all of them, in two nights, you're not really going to learn or retain anything, and you're not really involved in the course. So keep that in mind. I know some people might have travel plans. I've gotten a couple questions already about people that are going on holidays or going uh, out of the country for a week or two, and they still do this. The answer is yes. I mean, you will have more makeup work to do, but it's not um, unmanageable. We realize most of the people taking these courses have day jobs and have families and lives outside of this. So it's all built, you know, according to that model. That's great. If you could quantify kind of an hour time commitment a week, would you say roughly anywhere but like three to eight hours a week, just kind of ranging week to week? Yeah, that's a really good range. I'd say three to eight. You know, some of the design courses would probably be closer to the three to five because one of the things about the design is you have a you have a subjective opinion and you state it and you hear others. The development, you could be building something and you could just nail it the first time and you're done in two or three hours. Or you could reach a kind of a hurdle in your learning process and you could need to work with me and go back to it a couple times and you could get stuck on it for a while and it could take you, you know, six, seven hours, but the videos are fifteen minutes each. Reading the notes, if you're you know a typical reader, it's gonna take you thirty minutes. The real bulk of the course is the hands-on exercises, and those vary each week depending on the level of complexity. Um, and you'll actually see on the next slide, we kind of drew a bell curve to show you. Um, don't get fooled if you take the course. In week one, you're saying, this is a breeze. It only took me you know, two hours. 
it's intentionally designed for the difficulty and the length to be very short in the beginning to get you kind of into this model. And then about halfway through the course is where it's the most difficult in terms of the content, but also in terms of the length of the, the, the homework assignments. So you'll spend a lot more time in the middle weeks than you will in the beginning. And then we don't want anyone panicking at the end of the semester, so we taper down the content and the difficulty in the end of the semester so that you have time from that middle to catch up and, and not miss the deadline of obviously of the final grades. Um, so I would say three to eight is a really good ballpark. Eight is on the higher side, but there are some weeks in that middle where you are doing a programming assignment where it is going to take you um, that long. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, and I think um, questions, I mean, it's, you're obviously taking them now, but at the same time, questions throughout are, are very welcome. And I've always seen you as really a mentor, and you take so much passion in your students. I've just been so proud to, to, to work with you these last 10 years. So thanks so much for bringing all this knowledge today. More questions? Keep them coming. Um, I wanted to, maybe before we move on from the learning approach, um, as we kind of talk about technology in the course, we use a system called Canvas. It's our learning, learning management system. So once you register, um, you'll have access to your course once the course is launched on the day of, of, of the course that the course begins. Um, and there is, you launch directly through the registration system. So it's a single sign-on, right where you registered and paid, there's a button now that says Access Course. You click that and you launch directly into our learning management system, which is Canvas. And that is our um, place where the discussion boards and all of the work happens and all the conversation happens. And that is your, your you know, the playground to where you, um, where you do all the learning. Um, the tools and technology, so it's a cloud-based system. So really just any type of web-based interface like Internet Explorer or Firefox, everything works well. Um, Kevin, when you're thinking holistically about the all six classes, is there any kind of cost with technology that, or, or is it kind of technology agnostic? I mean, are we really just kind of using? Yeah, we're, it's a good question. We're using all open source, open standards, so a web browser, you know, doing HTML, you need a text editor, but if you're on a PC, you could technically use a notepad. If you're on a Mac, you could use text edit. There's also higher powerful text editors that are free that we recommend in the courses. The programming languages we mentioned are all open source. You can download and, and use for free. The one exception is Photoshop. Um, having said that, if you haven't used Photoshop before now, Adobe always gives a 30-day trial, full functioning trial, and you can get a majority of the class done in that time frame to see if it's right for you. Because I don't want someone to go out and buy a $600 application and then you say, you know what, I just don't like this. Um, we do offer student discounts as well, or Adobe offers student discounts, so you can get a, a good rate on it. But if, if you're not 100% sure you, you're going to like Photoshop, I'd recommend just downloading the 30-day trial a little bit before course starts, play around with it, and uh, if it's not right for you, you, you still take the course without investing any software. And, and even better, you know that it's probably not the thing for you. And then if you do love it, then you go ahead and make the investment. Everything else is, is free of cost. There is no additional software licenses you need to purchase. Perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of point that out in case anybody had questions regarding that. And um, good. And then I don't know. I don't see. I didn't re read the syllabi the syllabi too closely. But is there any textbooks that you recommend? Or are they more? Are they any required versus just recommended throughout the? Yeah, courses? really good point. I all of the courses I recommend textbooks, and and I state this in, in the first week to, to be clear, is a lot of times you have enough reading assignments through the notes and through the video lectures and through the practical hands-on. And there's always a week that is a little harder to grasp than another one. And you might say, oh, I just wish I had another way, another resource that I could use. And that's where the recommended book comes in. It's a book that would, in, in all of the six courses, that teaches the same approach that I do. And that way it gives you a little bit of reinforcement. And the reason I say that is one of the things you'll notice in here in this industry is it's not math. It's not two plus two is four. There's a hundred ways to accomplish something. So if you go on the internet and you look at a JavaScript sample, it might be done completely different than the way I teach it. And that could be very disheartening um, because you're not really learning. You're like, well, we never covered this. We never covered that. Um, so I like to use the notes and use this approach, which resonates well. And then I like to refer books when people need additional reading that reinforce using the same approach. Um, 
but they're not required. They're, they're always um, optional for you to use if you want additional resources for a given week. Okay, great. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that there's no, outside the cost of the course, the, the tools and technologies and the textbooks, there's no other um, additional costs unless you need further information. So really the information that you're getting in the course is going to be used in the course. Um, so some questions we have on that. So we do have one question from Allison wrote in. She's wanting to know about the version of Photoshop. Is it, do you use the most recent version of Photoshop or will any version do? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say use Photoshop version 2, but if you have any of the, the CS versions, um, potentially even going back to Photoshop 6, it's good. It actually works well with our learning objectives because Adobe changes. The core functionality remains the same, but the Adobe changes the user interface quite a bit. So one of the key learning objectives is, is understanding how to use the capabilities and finding where it is. So the fact that some of the videos are in Photoshop CS3 or CS1 or CS4 or whatever actually helps us because you shouldn't necessarily just be learning where things are located because it's going to change in the next version. You should learn you know, how to use those features. So if you have an earlier version, it, it's not a big deal. It's not a, it's not a deal at all. It, it works fine. Great. So let me move in. I know there's a couple questions about offering the schedule offering. So let's move to that. Um, these were career opportunities that we see a lot of career changers coming to us, and so they're seeking areas of where they could demonstrate the skills they learned in this program across these different um, avenues uh, listed here. Graphic designer, editor, web design specialist, programmer, developer, webmaster, project manager. Um, are, is that pretty consistent with what you're seeing, Kevin? Yeah, I, I'd say I'd add to this that the web industry is almost always every year when they talk about the recession-proof industries or things that are always growing. It's one of them is is nursing always, and the other one is always something in the web design field. It's it's a booming um, industry that's still relatively new, and they're adding more niches into it, and things are not going away; they're just evolving. So. Moving into a career in the web industry is something that thousands of people are doing, and you've seen through the presentation today, it could be something like content editing, where you're just used to be a newspaper editor and now you're an online editor, or it could be something more hardcore. So lots of opportunities there if you are interested in you know, jumping careers at some point. And having lots of transferability, too. Well, good. So um, kind of before we get into offering, just looking a little bit about the, the program and kind of the, the value add that I'm seeing um, resonate with the audiences, but you're going to get immediate return on what you're trying to learn, and that could showcase today with Kevin's, you know, delicate approach of, of kind of the practical, balanced with theory, balanced with practice, and having that all nicely woven together, and having you be able to prove your knowledge and extend your resume skills and diversify your skills, you know, have opportunities um, to extend it in a safe zone, maybe per personal uses, but then transition that to starting to freelance those skills out and then be able to, you know, stay on the, the state of the art skill set with your technology and art technology and kind of the, the science of the coding balanced with the art and the visual design. So those are the kind of the value adds that we are seeing from the benefits of this program, not to mention just this, you know, you know, mentor, instructor that's going to mentor you through the process and be your coach, be your Fitbit of accountability week by week, but then also your your professional coach week by week in, in the industry. And, I mean, I, I've seen Kevin network with his, with his um, you know, students, but how he supports them also professionally and sees them grow. And the stories are, are very rich and exciting, and I'm proud to have him continue working here at Oregon State University. Kevin, do you have anything else to add about a value add? Yeah, you, you nailed it all. I guess the only other thing I say is a lot of this stuff is so evolving and new that you don't go to university for that. You get it in programs like this. Every semester we're updating our programs with the latest and greatest. So even like 10 years ago, no one knew about responsive web. And if you wanted to learn about responsive web, you didn't go to university. You went to a continuing education degree like this. So we're able to gradually add in the latest and greatest trends faster than something that's a more traditional university approach. Uh, not taking anything away from that, but if, if you want to re reiterate immediate returns, if something's the hottest trend, like HTML5 was a decade ago, 
you're going to learn it here faster and you're going to be more marketable um, because you've already got the teaching and the experience with it. All right, so how do you get started? So we do have an offering schedule on our website. We um, The courses, it's again open enrollment. So we have a, two courses available to start. Um, they both begin June 27th. They're, uh, the first one is information uh, designed for the web, and then the next one is HTML5 and CSS. So one ranges about five weeks, and another ranges in eight weeks. Um, and that's kind of another question too I have for you, Kevin. Is you know, is it tolerable if, um, depending on your your work life integration, um, is it tolerable to take two courses at a time, or would you prefer them to take one course at a time? Um, I've seen a, a lot of students take two at a time, and, and it's tolerable. It, it's double the work, so you're looking at now six to you know 16 hours of work. What I would say is don't pick two development courses at the same time. Don't try to do um, JavaScript and PHP. Do like a development and a design course. So in June we're doing, uh, as you said, introduction to HTML and also um, uh, information design. Those are two complementary courses that, that would work well together, but not doing two programming courses at the same time. Right, so we have kind of an evolving door. We put two kind of coding science courses out at the same time, one, and then one kind of information, you know, art-focused, you know, information course out. So we have it basically two at a time running us through November. So that's kind of the offering schedule. They're, they range from a five-week course to the longest one is an eight-week course. So we're not even going the full 12-week quarter. Um, and so you, and then there, so the start dates are in June. And then the next series starts in September, and then the next series starts in November. And when you go to this, the website here to register, you can see that there's already the second set of offerings through 2017 listed on the web page. So if you can't take HTML5 um, now or in, the, in this June, you can take it again. And so we're going to be adding more. I mean, we, we have what we have now on the website, but we will be adding more as the demand grows. <clears throat> so we want to have good cohorts and I um, having workable cohorts. I think, Kevin, your ideal class size is? Oh, Kevin? Oh, sorry, it was I accidentally hit me for a second. Ideal class okay. size um, to me, anywhere from 10 to 15 to really get you know the, the core one-on-one -on -one values. Uh, Anything obviously we've done classes higher. It really depends if you have a course that are really engaged and motivated, and all the students want to learn. Um, there's this kind of line between they're learning from each other, which is great, and then I'm able to help them all out. If it's a smaller course, I can give them more one-on-one -on -one attention, but they're not doing the social collaborative approach of getting the feedback of everyone else. So usually, I'd say 10 to 20. Even it really just depends on. The type of students that are in that class. Like you said, you want a good cohort. You want to have groups that are working together to not just make it one to one, but it's it's many to many. Right. And so we're we're very sensitive to that. So we do cap it at 20. And so if you're interested in enrolling, we we definitely suggest you enroll now. Um, but at the same time we're we're balancing kind of the expectations and the support that Kevin will be able to give that same nurture and um, structure and support to everybody. So you know, being able to scale with the volume. And so, so he can keep cohorts smaller and that you can have learning communities in that peer-to-peer, -peer, but then also have the one-on-one -on -one attention with him. So we're we're trying to be very co cognizant of that, of your whole learning experience. Um, so with that, there's the link to register. Again, we're going to give you all of these slides. We're also going to send this recording to you. And here is our contact information for more, um, for more questions. Amanda Gildoff, who's not here on the line today, she is actually the project manager that worked with Kevin to get this course up and up and going. Um, so she's also available for questions. And um, you're welcome to call our main line. Just in, We have a full student support team that can help answer your questions as they come in. Um, the courses, great question, Judy. The courses can be taken out of order. Um, we have kind of a, an order here. Um, that we're offering our offering order, but if you want to jump in, and Kevin, you maybe you want to chime in to how you balance students and the prior knowledge that they bring to the table and kind of level setting um, the skill sets. 
Yeah, a lot of the courses, as you said, can be taken independently. There's some, like, if, if you don't have experience with HTML, um, I wouldn't recommend jumping to PHP um, or JavaScript before it. But having said that, if you, if you have working knowledge of HTML and you're confident in it, you kind of could make the leap. So all the design courses are meant to be taken independent. They're, 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 um, doesn't matter what order you take them. And the development courses, typically the HTML is the core one that I would recommend to go with first if you don't have any of that prior knowledge. But again, I don't think we're going to make you take it if you have that prior knowledge. You can reach out to the university and, and give them that experience and, and we can make the discussion of uh, does that kind of qualify you to go right into the other courses, which I think it would. Absolutely. So we're here for you to kind of figure out your, your roadmap for, for what you want to accomplish and we're excited to learn with you um, and to you know, have Kevin mentor you in this process. So we want to get more questions from you. I don't see any more at this time. Um, Allison was wondering about the version control. Judy asked about the order. Not so far all the questions that we have. Let's see. I think that was the last slide as well. So with that, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Um, we're just wrapping up the last three minutes. Again, this session has been recorded and you'll get all of our contact information in the next 24 hours. So feel free to respond back, share this recording, um, and feel free to follow up on any questions that you may have. Um, and we look forward to, um, to working with you and learning with you. Thanks, Kevin, so much for your time and your showing, showcasing your expertise. And I'm so proud to launch this program with you and to continue our partnership. Absolutely. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, everyone.